I'm going to start by wetting my paper. And today I'm using a block of watercolor paper. Uh, it's 300 GSM cold press. This one is a version of the Baohong paper, the Chinese paper, which is quite good. And it's got a nice texture to it. And it's glued on the sides, so I don't have to tape it down. Now that paper's nice and wet, I'm going to mix my sky colors. And I'm just going to use a range of different blues, ultramarine, cobalt, cerulean. Just um, dipping into different type of blues. Now this sky has a lot of clouds, but there is a bit of blue sky, a patch of blue sky that we can see through, and I'll start with that one. Now I do have a reference photo, but I'm not going to be too particular about it, as I never really am. I'm using it more as an inspiration. Now I'm mixing a grey colour, and I usually achieve that by mixing in some burnt sienna, maybe a little bit of alizarin crimson. The sky is actually quite important in this painting. It's pretty much the hero. So I want to make sure that I have a nice dynamic cloudscape in there that attracts the viewer's attention. And I achieve that through thinking about the shapes and where they go and the contrast of light and dark and making sure that we have some movement in the clouds just to create a good atmosphere. And that's why I take a lot of photos of clouds and have a large library of cloud photos just so that I got uh, lots of references. Now I'm going to paint the reflections of the sky at the same time. So I'm going to cover the entire page. Now you would have noticed that I did not draw any pencil lines for this seascape. It's pretty simple to draw or to paint, so I, I didn't bother. I kind of know where the things need to go. I can just look at my photograph. So I'm going to be quite free in this application of my sky and then paint a horizon where it's going to look the most interesting to divide the page. I sort of know it's in the lower third, so it's sort of in my mind. I kind of know what I want to achieve, so it's not that I'm completely clueless here. But I didn't want to constrain myself with any pencil lines. Now I'm mixing an even darker grey, pushing into purple really. I've added some Quinacridone Rose into the mix. I'm lifting out a few of the white clouds just to make sure that I have the right shapes and enough drama in my sky as well, adding some contrast. And before I let this all dry, I'm coming in with a flat brush and a bit more of the darker blues that I've mixed and drag in some cloud reflections just so that the foreground has a bit more variation. And then I'm rolling up a piece of my paper towel and then lifting out a few highlights where I'm going to paint uh, the rocks around it just so that we have some highlights inside the rocks. I've let that dry for a little bit but now I'm going to use my hairdryer just to speed up the process so I don't have to sit there and wait for that to dry. When I use a block because the papers are glued together it takes a bit longer. Uh, yeah, I'm showing you a pigment from Aquatone that is a company out of India that I got a few uh, tubes. This one is Brown Oxide. It's a very interesting color. It's pretty granulating and it's like a burnt sienna but it's a bit more red. So when I mix my ultramarine into it, it pushes it a bit further into sort of a purple brown rather than a gray grayish brown. So I'm eyeballing where I want to put my horizon line um, just so that it fits nicely into the clouds. You know, this could have been a bit higher, could have been a bit lower, but sort of look at what could be a natural um, line there where the clouds are behind it. 
This gives me a bit more freedom than if I had that predetermined with a pencil line and then the clouds happen to be lower or, or higher than what I wanted. Then I'd be stuck with the pencil lines. This way I'm completely free where exactly I want to put that horizon line. And I'm using my flat brush again just so that I, you know, try different things with different brushes. As you probably know by now, I mostly use round brushes or calligraphy brushes. So I rarely use a flat brush, but for this type of work, it's actually quite handy because you can just drag it horizontally and get a reasonably straight line uh, for, yeah, especially headlands that sit on top of a water surface. And I'm just strengthening that headland on the left a little bit. It sits a bit closer to the foreground than the ones on the right. So I want to have a little bit of difference in the tonal values. And then I'm going to continue straight. Cl coming closer to the camera, now closer to, to the viewer. And then just painting in those little outcrops. Now, I immediately realized this looks more like a fork. The distance between those um, horizontal lines is the same, and that's never a good thing. You always got to vary things. They shouldn't have the same length or the same width, so it shouldn't be spaced evenly apart. So now I'm trying to fix that by making one of them a little bit thicker so that the space between the second and the third one gets a bit less. And you can see that already looks a bit better. But then I also decide I'm going to pull the one at the bottom out a bit further or at least paint some further rocks just so that it doesn't look so symmetrical because that's boring. As I move even further into the foreground I'm going to add some more warmer colors to it, some raw sienna, a bit of burnt sienna, so that I get uh, more color into the foreground. Background has less color. It's always a bit more desaturated, a bit grayer, a bit bluer, and an easy way to differentiate foreground from background is always to add more color and more warmth into the foreground. So now I'm going to paint around those bits that I lifted out earlier. Those are water puddles on top of the rocks that will reflect the sky. And again, I'm loosely following my reference photo. It doesn't have to be precise. Let the brush do all the work and do all the thinking. And again, a flat brush is sometimes quite handy to paint rocks because they're quite angular, so you don't have to do too much work and just drag the brush in different directions to create rock surfaces. And I'm really enjoying how I can just use the edge of the brush to draw quite uh, precise lines. And I can just use the tip of the brush, just dab it onto the page and that creates an instant impression of little rocks. And while these are wet, I'm gonna add some darker tone at the bottom edge of these rocks. The light's coming obviously from the sky above. It's, the sun's kind of behind the clouds, so we're looking into the sun. So the shadow side is on our side at the at the front, in front of us, as we're looking at it, which makes it easy. That means you just have to put the shadow at the bottom of each rock and, and leave the top of the rocks lighter. That's where the light hits it. And now comes the stage where I just have to eyeball it. I have to look at how I like the pattern of the rocks. Is, is it enough? And is the water a nice negative shape? You know, do I like the shape of the ocean? Is that satisfying? Is it well balanced? Does it lead the eye into the painting or not? And I take 
pretty good care when I take photographs to already have a solid composition so I don't have to do too much changing when I paint. So the taking the photo is actually part of my painting process already. Here I'm covering the top half because I want to do some splattering and then just gonna uh, drop some water droplets in with my fingers so I just dip my fingers in the water and then splatter it because that's always nice for rock texture to have some water droplets and some, some, some paint splatters. Now the top half is pretty much dry already so I can go into those outcrops there with a bit of darker pigment and the area I'm just working on now I messed it up a little bit it didn't look quite nice I'm still not entirely happy with how that um, headland worked there so I'm just trying to still cor uh, correct that a little bit and by making that middle one a bit darker and overlapping the one in the very back I feel like I've created a bit more dimension but I also got to be careful not to overwork it and then here I'm adding just a tiny bit more detail just to distract the eye really and as I'm looking at the top and the sky there's a bit of shadow missing in the clouds for me just to get another layer of 3D into those clouds so I mixed a very pale gray and then I'm just going to add a bit of cloud shadow there underneath that big white mass and that also lets me turn one cloud into two because I've basically just separated that mass into two clouds and the same on that side adding a bit more shadow over there and then that main cloud there too that seems to be the focal point of the painting this is where the eyes naturally drawn to is through the heads and that's a very common device in composition is to create a path into the distance and leaving something open into infinity so beyond the horizon because we are naturally drawn to looking into the gaze into the distance so <clears throat> Painting the two headlands and leaving a gap there um, is a surefire way to attract the viewer into, into that gap so that cloud's becoming um, quite the focus there. Even though it's smack bang in the middle of the painting, which you know every composition book would say, don't put it in the middle of the painting, it can work. Now I'm going to add a bit more shadow. The painting is, is dry enough. for me to add some further values, dark values, onto those foreground clouds just to create a bit more texture and a bit more um, realism into those rocks. I love painting rocks because you don't have to be too careful and you can have a lot of texture and a lot of variation in colors. And as soon as you put the shadows in, that's when you define the rocks keeping it quite angular and also where a rough textured paper it really comes um, to your rescue because by just dragging the brush over it with um, very dry pigment or dry brushing just like that you create lovely textures that's perfect for painting rocks always keep an eye out for overworking this is when you can have too much fun or I can have too much fun and I keep painting until I've made a hot mess or just too much texture it's always important to keep the connections between the shapes going so we don't separate them into tiny bits because then it's just pebbles rather than rocks and that's a bit of a fine balance and sometimes I get it wrong and sometimes I get it right and now I'm using a smaller flat brush with a bit of uh, the darker blue color to get some horizontal lines into the ocean just to hint at some waves and I'm just gently dragging it across the paper to create some texture there and then distribute it, even it out a bit but getting a bit of movement into that water it 
looked a little bit too monotone, to be honest. Now, when you have a lot of horizontals in a painting like this with the headlands and the flat rocks in the foreground, uh, it's always helpful to have some verticals in there, also to connect um, the foreground with the background when there is no natural connection here. And we have the water that divides the top and the bottom part of the rocks. So I'm now putting in some long grasses that are growing in the foreground. Now I'll start off with some white grass uh, in the bottom part where the dark rocks are, otherwise I wouldn't be able to see that. And then with some darker pigment, I'm going to paint the top half of the grasses covering the water and the background of the headland you can see there. Um, I've already done that and I've finished that and then doing the same on the left side and adding some texture and just a little bit more stuff just to create a bit of interest. So that's my last tip for this painting. Connect your horizontals with verticals. Can be a lamppost, can be a tree, can be long grass. But that helps bring the whole painting together and connect different parts of it. I'm quite happy how this turned out. That didn't take me too long. It wasn't too difficult. It didn't have to use any pencil lines. Um, but it's a lovely little sky. It's one of my favorite places on the Sydney Harbour. And I'm quite happy with it. And I hope you enjoyed this video. And you will give this one a try. Thank you.